Okay, uh, good evening, guys, and uh, thank you for logging on. I'm looking forward to, God willing, hopefully another enjoyable share this evening. And we, again, have some very practical halacha lemaisa things that are going to be coming up. Uh, we're going to be talking, we're going to be continuing our discussion about selling a shul and what do you do with the shul, what do you do with the proceeds, how can it be done, when can it be done, what way it can be done. And then the um, the second part of this year in the Gemara we're going to talk about Tashmishe Mitzvah and Tashmishe Kedusha. Um, you know, let's say you're done with the Ritsuos, the straps of your tefillin, or you're done with your Lufin Esog, or you're done with a, uh, a Sefer Torah. What are the proper ways uh, to, for lack of a better, for lack of better term, uh, dispose of something that was either used for a holy purpose or has uh, scriptures written in there? What is the proper way to treat it and dispose of it once you are done with it. And then the final part of this year tonight is we're going to be asking a question. Uh, as you might be familiar, there's something called the base hakinesis, which I'll just translate as the shul, the sanctuary where we primarily daven. And there's the base uh, hamedrash, which is meant for Torah study. So which one is holier than the other? Now you might say, who cares? They're both holy, right? So the reason it's going to be relevant, again, is because, uh, as we said, Ma'al B'Kodesh Ve'imoridin, you can only go up in Kedusha. So if I sell a base medrash, can I turn it, can I use the funds to buy a base Akneses? If I sell a base Akneses, can I sell it to buy a base medrash? So that will be the final point that we'll discuss tonight. Uh, but God willing, along the way, uh, we'll try to weave in some of the practical halakhic bottom lines as, uh, as relevant. So, okay, we find ourselves on the top of Chavvav Ahmed Bey's 26B. Welcome to the folks joining us now. I was just giving an overview of what to expect. You didn't miss any of the Gemara yet. Don't worry. Uh, we are, if you're following in the uh, the regular text of the Gemara, it's five lines down from the top. Rami Bar Abba. I would venture to guess it might even be a separate paragraph in the art scroll. Maybe. Uh, but it's definitely, it has to be on the first page in the art scroll. So 26B, first power. Here we go. Rami bar Abba, have a kabani bay kinishta, have a he kinishta hasika, and have a bay le mystere, la sui le vni extremi, navely la hasam. So this is what's going on. Uh, Rami bar Abba, he basically wants to demolish the old shul and take the, uh, the bricks and the beams from the old structure and to use it toward the new shul building that they are creating. So, Yasin Kamevayle Hadrav Chista. The question about the permissibility of destroying or demolishing a shul before you have another shul in place, uh, it's subject basically to the teaching of Rav Chista. The Amar Rav Chista. That one is not permitted to demolish one shul until they have another shul that is ready and operational, uh, ready to be used in town. So we might say, what's the reason that you can't demolish that shul? Well, because you're going to be poche, you're going to be negligent, you're going to neglect to, you're going to, what's going to happen is you're going to be so. Uh, zealous and quick to destroy the first shul. Meanwhile, you didn't actually finish building the second shul. So maybe I would think it should be different here because the only reason you're taking beams and bricks out of the first shul is because you actually <laughs> you actually are going ahead and building the second shul. You want to use the material from the first one. So um, so Kiai Gavna Mai. So what do we do in so in our case where there seems to be a reasonable basis? Seems to be in the end of the day that still is not going to be an exception to the rule. Also, the commander of Hubba Vasserle, then the commander of Huda Vasserle. Uh, I didn't see anyone who addressed it, but maybe I didn't search hard enough. It's interesting. They first asked the Shaila to Rav Papa, who said, You cannot even begin to take materials from the old shul before the second shul is ready. And then they go and ask Rav Huna, who also tells them that it's Usser. So, uh, it's a little bit intriguing that they 
got a sock from one rabbi and then they went to ask another one because I, I, I mean i'm sure i don't i don't want to say we do this all the time but it's something you know people like to do when they don't get the sock that they want uh but we have a principle <laughs> that in general once you get a stock from one rabbi, you're not allowed to go get a stock from another rabbi. It might depend on what area of halacha. It might depend uh, if it's uh, mishum kavod or mishum other reasons. Uh, it's a whole entire sugya. Which again, I'll say that was the that was the mini share I gave on my on my Zoom interview for the shul, which was can you uh, can you get a second opinion on halacha? So anyway, I'm just pointing out that observation. I'm sure someone addresses it, and I just didn't, didn't see that. Okay. Uh, moving on. Amarava. So now we're going to be talking about selling a shul. So as we established last week, if one sells a shul, uh, you have seven trustees. Is that the term we use? Trustees. Tove ha'ir. And it's in the presence of the community and you sell the shul. Not only are you allowed to sell the shul in such circumstances, but the funds that are being paid to purchase the shul also, um, they can be used for non kedusha non-sanctified purposes. That's, that's, this special mechanism allows it. However, if you're not doing it under those conditions, uh, it's being sold, not, let's say, not in the presence of the, of the people of the city. So then what's going to happen is something very similar to what we see with uh, Meiser Shani. We saw it with Kedusha Shviyas. Which uh, the idea is that kedusha sanctity we transfer from an object onto money. So you need to bring your fruits up to Jerusalem. Uh, that's very onerous. So what God says in the Torah, you can do is you can take the kedusha and be it and redeem it onto these coins, which are far more portable. Bring them to Jerusalem and then buy food there. And then transfer the kedusha from the coins onto the food there and eat that food in Jerusalem from the vendors. So a similar idea over here, the kedusha might be taken away from the shul, but then it goes on the proceeds um, that they made from the shul. So Amar Rava, with that background, Rava teaches us Hai Beknishta Khalufa Uzvuna Shari Ugra Umashkuna Aser. So when it comes to, let's say you want to exchange the shul uh, for an object in return, or you're selling the shul for money, that would be okay. However, the issue is that when you rent out the shul or you give it over as a mashko and as a security, us, sir, it would not be permitted to be used for non-kedusha, non-shul purposes. Why? My taima? Because it remains sanctified. When you sell it or exchange it for an object, the kedusha from the shul um, leaves the shul and is transferred onto the item that's being exchanged for the shul. So now the shul can be used for non-holy purposes. However, when you're just renting it out or giving it temporarily for some purpose, the shul remains in its Beis HaKnesis Kadosh status, and uh, therefore it has to be used strictly for Basic purposes. So you could rent it to another shul. What was that? So then you could rent it to another shul. Yes, you'd be able to rent it to another shul. And in fact, by the way, uh, we see it all the time where a shul will rent out space to a yeah. smaller shul. Uh, you'll see that done many times. And um, yeah, based on this principle, very good point, Toby. I have a question. Yes. If we back up a bit, uh, in, in terms of demolishing a shul, I would assume that a community, before they start demolishing a shul to build a bigger one with the same materials, are going to have a place to daven. Yeah. They're not going to give up davening. So uh, in that context, they're going to continue to daven in a place that either has permanent kedusha or they give a temporary kedusha to daven there. Why can't they demolish the, the original shul and build a new one while well, they're still dominating as a kahila. Yeah, so I think I think Sadie, what you're pointing out it is actually what's practice is that, you know, let's say um, you know, you want to build, you want to rebuild your shul from scratch on the same campus, on the same property. So what you'll do temporarily is you'll um, rent out a place somewhere else, and that's where you'll dominate in the meantime while your shul is under construction. Uh, I think that's actually what the folks down the road are planning on doing. Um, but that yes, that's 
that is a that's a very uh, standard thing to do based on those principles. So unlike the case of the Gemara, where you would have nowhere else to dive in. So, you know, thankfully nowadays people can find places to rent out in the meanwhile. Okay, so where, where were we? Ah, however, let's say, okay, so now let's say you don't want to just um, sell the shul, whole, uh, the entire shul, but you want to sell materials from the shul. So, right, we're talking about the bricks. Libni nami chalufinu uzvaninhu shari uzvinhu aser. So if you want to lend out the um, lend out the materials from the shul, I don't know practically how this works. You take bricks out of the whole shul and you lend them out. I guess the structures back then weren't as uh, robust. And uh, it was like Lego. You just attached things back then. Uh, so that you can't do. Similar to how you the Ritva adds in, you wouldn't be able to um, use it as collateral or rent it out either. But you can exchange or sell it for the same reason because the Kedusha is Paka. It leaves the original object and it goes on to the proceeds. Um, Rabbi, can I, can I go back a sentence? What's can you explain the issue about the mortgaging being prohibited? Mortgaging, if the proceeds go to the shul, where's the where's where's the where's the negative? Um, uh, <coughs> right. So the plan, since the shul plans on retaining the shul, the shul remains a base haknesses. It remains uh, under the ownership of the community as their base haknesses. You're not. What you're doing is you're renting it out to be utilized by someone else in the meantime. So it's not that it's becoming a uh, a recreation hall temporarily. It's a base haknesses that's being rented out for someone else who's having permission to use it in the meanwhile. So it remains a base haknesses in status and therefore it'd be forbidden for the, the person renting who's leasing the place to use it for a purpose that wouldn't uh, be becoming of a base haknesses. Uh, the problem may be mine. My translation has that mortgaging the shul is prohibited. Which means, well, you're all using article probably, right? I mean, Safari, yeah, so it's Stein's I'll use the same one. But which, which word? Which word are you translating? Mishka, uh, Mishka Noah. Okay. So they use that as... Wait, one moment. I use it as if they were... Yeah, let me... Uh... It's it. Mm. Ogura Umishka no Asur. And then it's translated to rent it or to mortgage it is not permitted. Yeah, let me... Zabuna. All right. Agura mashkuna la schiro ole mashkno al halva. Al dashim akabi shanish will tzarek Um Okay, my my misifta translation here says that you are using it as a mashkun, as a security or a collateral for a loan. Um, so maybe a machlokis, the misifta gemara uh, versus the art scroll gemara. So I'm I'm going to go with the misifta on this one. Because uh, a mashko, that's generally what a mashko is. Generally, a mashko in halacha is a collateral. So mm -hmm. um, it's meaning a collateral generally is given over to someone temporarily while a debt is being paid off. So, right. When, when you give a mortgage, you're you still the owner. owner. You're still yeah. the owner. So if you're the owner, then the synagogue still has its sanctity. And the yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's right. And that's, and that's per se. Temporary. Um, yeah. It, it, that, that's, that's, I think that's the significant part, whether or not you're retaining ownership yeah. or not. Exactly, and that's um, that's why it's us, sir, to use it for non-basic message purposes. Exactly. Okay, good. I think we're on the same page. I think so, right? Okay, good. <laughs> All right, good. I'm glad we clarified that point. Um, okay, so back to the, so the bricks, right? Similar idea. If they retain their Kedusha, they cannot be used for non-sacred purposes. Bahani mili batika, batikasa. This is talking about bricks and beams that were previously used as part of the building. But new beams that have not yet been incorporated into the shul, they're just laying on the side for construction workers, but they actually haven't been placed into the building yet. There's no Kedusha, there's nothing to worry about uh, at all. Even according to the Mandamar who holds, this is a very important Talmudic concept to know, uh, if Hazmana Milsehi. Uh, just very quick background. Um, when you, Hasmana basically, like, you know, like a modern Hebrew, right? You invite somebody, right? You designate something. So when you set aside something for the for sanctified purposes, 
is the act of designating it and sanctify and setting it aside enough to already give it its status of Kedusha, um, to make it usher for others to use. This comes up in the discussion of preparing tachrichen, preparing burial shrouds. So once something is already designated for the purpose of burial shrouds, it has to be used for that purpose. But it's a debate at what point, you know, <clears throat> once it's actually used or it's just um, weaving something for the sake of burial shrouds already enough to prohibit it for any alternative use. So, so what are we saying? Even according to the man de Amar, the one who generally says that designating something for a, prohibit, for a use that will prohibit it uh, is enough to already make it forbidden, even here, he would admit that these beams are not considered pre-designated and can be used for other purposes if they've not yet been put into the building. Why? Hani Mili can go to Ha'orig Beg of the Mace. Because that whole debate in the Gemara over there is when the begging was already woven uh, for the deceased. However, here, this is like even a step earlier. Um, this comes up like in Hilcho Sitzis, comes up in Hilcho Shabbos. This is where I know my very minimum bare amount of how sewing and that kind of stuff works. Uh, but apparently, right, so when you're making Sitzis, um, or you're making um, some kind of garment, there's the weaving, but before you get to weaving, you have to spin the uh, material into the strings. So that's tvia. And so that is like two steps beforehand. So spinning uh, the cloth, spinning the threads for the sake of tachrich and for the burial shrouds, that's so far removed that that's not even considered pre-designation. So the Gemara is suggesting that similarly over here, beams that are just like hanging around in the parking lot and have not been put to any use in the shul yet, they do not have any pre-designated Kedusha to them. If you decide we have enough beams, the shul is already built, everything's good to go, and there's some excess, they can go to another project. It can be used to make a pizza shop, it can be used to make an ice skating rink, it can be used to make the JCC, whatever you want. Okay. So that's the point of the Gemara over here. Good. Now, one last little piece on this section, and then we complete the section about selling shuls uh, for now. Um, matana, let's say you want to give the shul away as a gift. Um, that's quite the birthday present. You know, <laughs> happy birthday, you just earned the shul, which actually we could argue uh, being in charge of a shul might be less a gift than more of a, uh, more of a uh, you know, a liability. Uh, but anyway, we won't elaborate on that. So, Matana, Pligi Barav Acha Bravina, Chad Ozer Chad Shari. One says um, that if you give away the shul as a Matana, so the question is if the shul now, if the guy wants to convert the shul into an ice skating ring, can he do that? So, it's Machlokis. Mada Asar, so just change the gear set. I think it makes more sense this way. The Mai Tifka Kedushatsa. If you're only if you're giving the um, synagogue away as a gift and you're not getting anything in return, then the shul remains a shul because where are you going to transfer its kedusha to? So it's going to stay a shul. Um, that that seems fairly reasonable, right? However, what we need to understand is Umad the Shari, according to the guy, according to the who says that you can give away a shul. And the shul will lose its kedusha just by giving it away. How does that work? So, well, what are you getting in return? You're getting the hana. You're getting the satisfaction of giving it to this person. So, so it's as if you sold it to him. Which, let's just break this down for one moment. So, you're telling me that instead of money, I can give I can give away the shul as a gift, and I get this in, non, you know, non-tangible satisfaction of giving it to this person. He must have been a very special person. And the Kedusha goes on to the Hana, to the satisfaction. Can anyone explain that? Yeah, I think, what, I think what they're saying is that if, you, if, the, if the shul, if the people who run the shul 
felt that this was something they wanted to do, then they must have already gotten some benefit from this guy. Ah, very good, very good. That it came so, before. Yeah, so some of the, um, I think it's the Ron. Let, just, let me just make sure I'm giving you the right person. Um, the Namuki Yosi points out what Toby said, that um, the guy who's getting the shul isn't just, you know, someone that they wanted to honor, but he already gave significant donations and uh, uh, certain services to the community. And the community, again, it seems like really odd that they would do that. They're giving him a shul in return for whatever services and whatever objects he donated. So the Muki Yosef adds into the Gemara, he says, um, we have to assume he gave something tangible that the Kedusha could be poda onto. So it's not as radical of an idea. By the way, this isn't as foreign of an idea. There is a very amusing case that comes up in Meseches Kedushan, um, in which, um, so a man has to give something to a woman uh, in order to marry her, right? So you, a man gives the ring and in exchange, she gives herself over to him. So there's a case where she can give him a gift and the satisfaction, and if he's an Adam Chashiv, he's a very, you know, prestigious person. And so she has, you know, like a celebrity, she has so much satisfaction that he accepted her gift. That satisfaction can be what can be what he gives her to be Makadish. So he doesn't have to give her a ring, he gives her the satisfaction, the Hana of accepting a gift from her. I mean, it, it's a very, again, I'm, I'm going to use a mild term, very amusing case, um, if nothing else. So, I have, like, related, yeah, I have a rela related question. If you sell the shul, the kedusha is transferred to the money, the proceeds, correct? Mm -hmm. Is there any restriction on how the proceeds can then be used because it's oh, kadosh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, exactly. There, it's um, So, go back to, I'm glad you brought this up, Paul, because this we should, we should look back at the Mishnah. So remember, the Mishnah has a whole hierarchy um, of, you know, if you sell a shul, then you can use it. What was it? Why am I, I having it by heart? I have it right over here. If you sell a basic message, you could buy an ark. And if you sell the ark, you could buy the coverings for the safer term. And in the coverings, you can sell. So basically, that money now can either be used to buy another shul or something of a higher tier of Kedusha. That's what's going to happen. So, yes, yeah. that's why. Right. I got a, a, a situation which I'm curious about. Your Uncle Lippa davens in a shul that is the basement of the rabbi's house. Yeah. He, I presume his wife is also on the deed. So they own the house. He turned his basement into a shul, connected mm. something or other. And I've davened there a number of times. I've duck in there a number of times. And it really is a shul. Now, can he sell the house? Mm. Uh, can he just discontinue the use of the basement as a shul and turn it into, uh, let's say, a hobby uh, shop and do carpentry for the fun of it? What's the situation? Yes, that's uh, without without commenting on the specific shul, but uh, just the general situation, right? So that's what you'll see at many shtiblach. The, uh, the Rav will live and his family live on, on the upper level and the Shul will be on the lower level. Mm -hmm. I, I think what you could do is you could bifurcate and say that that lower level um, is the Shul and the upper level is a house and they can have two different statuses in Halacha. We don't have to look at the whole building in one shot. By the way, um, you look even at our Shul. Yeah, um, but when you how sell can it, you, it you go to sell it. Yeah, or tear it down. Uh, I'm sorry, it actually... Um, my, my Zoom just froze for a second. Can you say that again? No, Toby, go ahead. I, I was just saying that if, if, what, if, you, if it comes time that you want to sell it, now what happens to the proceeds that's attributable to the upstairs? Is, I, I mean, practically, it's not really apportioned. It's one thing. It's one package. I mean, and what about the, the Stiebel, I think, is a little bit analogous to what we talked about last week. If you remember last week on Chafav Amid Aleph, we had a case with was it Rabbi Eliezer or Ravashi? Who was it? It was, it was Ravashi, I believe. Ravashi, we said, uh, basically, he was the owner of the shul. And even though people donated to the shul, um, the shul was all about the rabbi there. It was his steeple, it was his shul. And um, they were like, you know, the shul general fund and the rabbi's discretionary account were like, we're just one thing. Um, so, 
in a case like, I think that might be analogous to what a shtibel is. Generally a shtibel, if people come, I mean, some people just might like the shtibel kind of feeling, but it's kind of built around the rabbi as opposed to many shuls like ours, uh, which there's a shul and the shul hires a rabbi. You know, you know what I mean? Um, so in a case like that, he can unilaterally decide what he would want to do with that shul. Um, he might, as a formality, have to get, you know, if they're, I don't even know how it works. Like if there are, I'm sure it's trustees, um, and, then, and then sell it kind of publicly in front of the members of the shul. Um, and I think pra practically speaking, that is, again, I haven't been personally involved in the sale of the shul. I hope I don't need to be involved in that, but I would assume you would get the, the board together and you would get, you would make a, you know, get the public, make them aware of what's going on, and then you would sell the shul. That, and that way, there's no kedusha on the shul, and there's no kedusha on the money. So that way, on a practical level, we don't have to deal with these kind of uh, limitations. That's what I think would happen. Uh, Toby. Rabbi, I, I, I've been making the assumption on all these things we've been talking about, that you're talking about where basically the shul, there's one building. What if a shul has more than one building? Like we used to own the Hebrew school building. Yeah. Um, and it was quite a to-do <laughs> when that ended up getting sold. Um, right. It, it, I mean, if, if the shul owns unattached property, yeah. how is that handled? So, so I, I, I'll go one step further. I think when, when we say shul right now, uh, shul has two meanings for us. Shul means the shul as an institution and shul also more specifically, I should use the term base hakneses. The sanctuary of our shul is the closest you get to what we would call a base hakneses, which is an area that's designated for prayer. Um, the shul social hall um, doesn't necessarily have, I, I, it's interesting, I don't think the shul social hall would have the same status as the sanctuary. Otherwise, it'd be forbidden to eat in the social hall, which would make Kiddush very difficult. Um, so I don't, it's not that like the shul owns property <coughs> and now it has a status of a base hakneses. Um, it's the areas that are designed for prayer that would have that status. Now, practically speaking, if, if we want to sell our shul, which uh, I don't think we have any plans, so we just renovated it. I hope we're not looking at that. Um, we would probably be selling it as one entire edifice. So then we would have to reckon with the fact that there's a base hakneses inside the shul. But um, is that, does that help clarify? Like when we say shul, sometimes we mean institutionally yeah. shul, but here we're talking about base hakneses specifically, I believe. Uh, back then, I imagine like the shuls, you go to ancient Babylonia, they didn't have the luxuries we have today where they have like this wing and that wing and that hole for this person, you know, like they, the shul, I think was just for prayer. Like, it was a shul. That's what it was. Um, okay. Back to the Gemara. We're moving on to a new section right now. Okay. We're done with shuls for now. Tanarabana. Tashmishe mitzvah nizraki and tashmishe kedusha nignaz, an important rule. There's something called tashmishe mitzvah which are things that are used to perform mitzvos and Tashmisha Kedusha, which, uh, well, you know what? Why should I tell you what's what? The Brisa is literally about to explain what is Tashmisha Mitzvah, what is Tashmisha Kedusha. But the important rule to know is Tashmisha Mitzvah, when you're done with them, you can dispose of them. The Ramah says it has to be done respectfully or rather not in a way that's disrespectful since it was once used for a mitzvah, but, but, um, the Ikar Din, there's no longer any Kedusha, whereas Tashmish and Kedusha, like, like Svarim, Sifri Torah, uh, even when you're done using them, they retain their Kedusha, therefore Nignazin, therefore we bury them. And the way we'll, we'll talk about in the Gemara, the way you dispose of Sefer Torah, it's put in a Klicheres in a earthen, earthenware and then buried. Okay, the Elohim Tashmish and Mitzvah, what are Tashmish and Mitzvah? Give me some examples. Sukkah, Alulav, a shofar, sitzis. So these objects are used for mitzvos. But your lulav, once you're done with your lulav, um, it no longer, after sukkis, it no longer has any kedusha. Um, you shouldn't put it with all the grimy things in your garbage because that would be a bizayon to something that was once used for a mitzvah. But it doesn't require geniza. You don't need to bury it in the ground. Though, to be honest, between me and you, I mean, that, that might be like an easy organic way of actually getting rid of it. Uh, okay, if alien Tashmisha Kedusha, what are examples of Tashmisha Kedusha? So Tashmisha Kedusha, sorry, I may have misdefined it for a moment. Um, 
there's the things that actually have inherent kedusha, which are the Sifrei Torah, and then things that um, serve, right? That are that are mishamish, things that serve the svarim. They are tashmishe kedusha, such as dulos kamei svarim tefillin and mezuzos, the tikshel sefer Torah, the nartik shel tefillin urtsu osehem. So we're talking about the different bags. Uh, that hold Sfarim, Tfilim, Azizos, uh, that hold a Sifrei Torah, that hold our Tfilin, and the straps of the Tfilin. So this is something interesting to note. I want to take a moment to elaborate on this. Uh, so a Tfilin bag, for instance, is a Tash, as a Staz of, of, of Tashmish uh, Someone came over to me in Shul, and uh, this happened about two weeks ago. So when Udam was in 630 Shakras made, he said, you know, I've had this bag since I was bar mitzvah for 50 years. Um, it finally gave in. It's torn. It's no longer usable. What do I do with it? I said, I'll take care of it. And I put it in our in our Giza box at the shul. That's how you dispose of it. But the interesting question I'll pose to you now is what about the straps of tefillin? Do the straps of tefillin have kedusha? So oh, from, this tomorrow, yeah. <laughs> so, well, what to what degree? So it would Theme from what the Gemara is telling us here that the Ritsuos are only Tashmishe Kedusha. They are Kedusha by association because the straps are part of what's what's the Kedusha? There's um, parchment with, with you know that that's inside the filling. So that's what the that's what Kedusha is. But the straps don't have any inherent Kedusha. They are Tashmishe Kedusha. Now here's the thing though. If you take a look at the second tosos on the daf here, if you look over here, Tashmishe Kedusha, Tosvos makes an observation. If you notice, the straps of our tefillin actually have, they actually form letters. We have, um, so there's a shin on the tefillin itself. And then we have the knots that form a dalid and a yud, which uh, spells Shakai, a name of God. So that's interesting. If the Ritsuos themselves are helping spell the name of God, you would think they have inherent Kedusha, not just Tashmishe Kedusha. So Tosa says, Nikan Mashma, Shadalis Vahayud, Shabakesha Ritsua, Ainon Osios Gamuros, the Lohavi Halachal Moshe Misinai, Kim Hashin Shabbat, and Mikol Kari Hakalajus El Tashmishe Kedusha. So what Tosa infers from here, unlike uh, what Rashi elsewhere says, that the Ritsuos, um, even though there's a dala and yud on it, unlike the shin, which we learn from a tradition of halachal Moshe be Sinai, laws that were given to Moshe at Sinai, uh, the, the dalit and the yud though uh, were just a later um, or just a later enactment. They're not considered, you know, the real deal, and therefore the ritzuos only have tashmishe kedushah status. Nonetheless, remember they might not have inherent kedushah. But they still are Tashmishe Kedusha. And even Tashmishe Kedusha uh, have Kedusha by association and need to be buried. By the way, so I'm going to point out right now, here's a question. You will go to Minyanim, not, not at our school, of course, but you'll go to Minyanim in places where you'll see men take out their twill in the morning for their shell yad. They throw the straps on the floor and then, you know, they roll, they roll it up from there. And I have to tell you, that's one of my biggest pet peeves ever. It bothers me so much to see that uh, because the straps are Tashmishe Kedusha. They're not just, you know, like a yo-yo or something that you can just throw around like that. And don't take it from me. I'll, I'll, give, it, I'll give you a source right now. Don't take it from me. Um, this is quoted in the Kitzer Shla. It's uh, the Shulchan Espaz's position. Uh, here, here's a good formulation. Uh, so by the way, there's already a debate about whether there's a violation by dragging your tzitzis on the ground. Uh, another pet peeve of mine, especially when we were out in the tent uh, during the holidays and it was raining. And I see like, you know, all, a lot of the men in the tent were like walking around and their tzitzis were like, being pulled through the dirty, murky waters. And I saw people walking out with their tits all black and brown. So I had to make an announcement I'm like, guys, don't ruin your talisim, please. So there's already a, a discussion about how, according to many, it's us or even just to drag your tzitzis, which, mind you, are only Tashmishe mitzvah. 
certainly Kal Vachomer for the straps of Tefillin, which are Tashmishe Kedusha, which are even higher than that. Um, and so you'll see in some shuls, this is what's being reported, that if someone sees tzitzis on the floor, or even there's like a talus and the tzitzis are kind of like touching the ground, people will jump to pick it up as if they, as if it's like a safer Torah that fell on the floor. But in year or two, that's when they grasp all our it's in chosh with zeki lehut or two as a sandal. But if they see the straps and the tefillin on the floor, they'll be like, eh, it's no different than the straps of someone's sandal that's on the floor. Lo od as your rabbi may ame ha aritz mashlim from its or two as the kavana aritz the chosh shi b'kach klum. Not only that, but there are many ame ha aritz. Who wants to translate ame ha aritz? People of the earth. Oh, <laughs> okay. Well, that's a, yes. That that's the literal translation. Right. Exactly. Um, Ignoramuses. Well, okay, we'll go with that. That's probably the more accurate translation. Um, who will throw their rituals onto the ground deliberately, um, thinking that eh, it's just the straps. Who cares? And nobody protests this. No one speaks up. And really, if anything, we should be more stringent about the dignity of the Ritsuos, more so than the Tzitzis. Um, I'll just say it's not a zero-sum game. I think both of them are important, and we should be careful for both. But again, don't take it from me. Uh, there you have it. Okay. Um, Akan Dvarai, or not Dvarai, but off of my soapbox now. Question, Rabbi. What was that, if, John? If, if the Tzitzis are damaged, does that change the status? Um, you're saying if the Tzitzis yeah, are like hustled? Puzzle, yeah. Yeah, if they're puzzle, so then what happens is they're no longer usable for a mitzvah, and then they lo no longer have the kedusha anymore. So then what comes down to it is you're supposed to dispose of it in a way that's not disrespectful, but once it's invalidated, it can no longer be used for the mitzvah, um, that's when it loses kedusha. I mean, also, of course, if you take the tzitzit off of the garment, then also it loses its kedusha that way because it no longer but has you, any mitzvah functionality. But you can throw it out just like that. You can't just throw it in the garbage. Exactly. So the Ramah says that, like Phyllis just said, that even though, in theory, it has no Kedusha, since once upon a time it was used for a mitzvah, um, it has to be treated with respect. By the way, it's an interesting discussion. I forgot where I saw it. Back, back when I was uh, when we did that show on rabbinic honorifics, so there was a question, what if someone... The reason, you know, Tama Chakam gets respect, but just give ourselves some background feedback coming somewhere. Um, so the reason that Tama Chakam uh, gets respect is because of the Torah that he has. So the question is, what if someone, you know, God forbid, because at a certain point he just um, has memory issues and no longer retains any of his Torah. You're still, still supposed to regard him with respect uh, for the Torah that he once knew. So it's a very similar, I, I'm not sure if anyone makes this analogy, so if not, you're hearing it first. Uh, it's a similar idea to Tashmishe Mitzvah, that even if they're no longer used for the purpose of the mitzvah, they don't have any functionality, we respect it for what it once was used for. Okay. Um, so back into the Gemara, Amar Rava. The Rava is going to break down some practical examples for us right now. Amar Rava. So basically, it's going to be a series of I would have thought that Y status, but then I found out this is, and therefore X has Z status. We'll see exactly what I mean. Amarava, may Reish have Amina, Hai Kursaya, Tashmish, and Tashmish. So I would have thought that a Kursaya, which Rashi says is a Bima Shell 8, so that's the Shulchan that you put the Torah on. So I would have thought that it's a Tashmish, the Tashmish. It's two steps because you have the bima, and then you have the uh, cloth that's put over the bima uh, that the Torah goes on. So it's two steps of the tashmish the tashmish, which wouldn't have, well, by definition, is not tashmish kedusha. It's because it's a tashmish the tashmish. So I would thought it's tashu tashu shari, and therefore it doesn't have any kedusha. And if you want to turn that bima into a uh, a table that you want to use to serve food on or whatever else, that'd be fine. Even the chazin, the mostly elusi, with Torah, I mean, Tashish Kedusha Huva Aser. Once I saw that there were instances where the cloth wasn't present and they put the Torah directly on the bima, 
So then I realized that the Bima has a status of Pashmish Kedusha and all of the associated parameters. Moving on. Um, so the Prisa is referring to the curtain on the Ark. There's a focus here, Rashi and Tosos, where this parochas is. Tosos gives us the more intuitive one that what you and I see every day in our shul, the parochas is on the outside of the ark. Rashi thinks that the parochas is referred to here is actually on the inside of the ark. Uh, so at any rate, Rav has said, I used to think that the curtain of the ark would be considered two steps removed. The past but apparently what they used to do back in the day uh, is that they would sometimes use that curtain to wrap around the Sifra Um So if you take Rashi's interpretation of the Gemara, that makes more sense because the Prochas uh, was inside the Ark, so it could wrap the Torahs. If you take Tosa's approach, um, it makes it less sense mechanically, but it makes sense why you would think it's considered a Tashmish to Tashmish, because the Aro, the Ark, is a Tashmish to Kedusha, and then the Prochas is outside the Ark, which makes it two steps removed, so it's a Tashmish to Tashmish. Um, at any rate, we don't use the Prochas of our Arks to serve the, um, well, so you're right, so there's a bit of a question today if the Prochas is a Tashmish or Tashmish to Tashmish. Okay. Um, a lot of a lot of fun words over here. Baba Rava, Rava, Rava said further. Hi Tevusa de Irfat, the Abi Teva Zutrasi, Shari, Krusaya Asu. So Rava says that if you want to take an ark um, that is already that's dilapidated, it's falling apart, and you want to make a smaller one. So you want to take an ark. You want to salvage whatever's left, and you'll make like a, a small mini arc for the Shiva Torah. So that is permissible. Kursaya Asir. But if you want to make a Kursaya out of it, which we said before is a Bima, that would be forbidden. Now, here's the question why would it be forbidden? Rashi says, Shiyarda Mikdushasa. It goes down a tier in Kedusha. But we just established that the Bima has the status of Tashish Kedusha, just like the Ark is a Tashish Kedusha. So why can I repurpose the materials from the ark to make a bima? So to which uh, I think it's the Ron that suggests that's about kvias. Since the bima is only used momentarily for the Torah, for uh, you know, like 10 minutes when the Torah is put on it, or 30 or 20, 20, 25 minutes, however long the leaning <laughs> is. So it's still to a certain degree half a tier lower than the ark which is the actual resting place of the Torah. So you can't repurpose materials from the Ark to build a Bima, which only uses the Torah momentarily. Okay. Bama Rava, further, Rava said, I Prisa Devala, and Mevda Prisa Lesifre Shari, Lechumshin Aser. So if you want to take the, um, the curtain from the Ark that is starting to wear out and repurpose it, as a cover for the Sifrei Torah, well, then you're going up a level in Kedusha, or at least the same level. But um, but it used to be back then, since they didn't have books, they didn't always make Sifrei Torah as one big book, but they would have one for Sefer Gracious, one for Sefer Shmos. It wasn't necessarily used for Kriya Satorah. So you wouldn't be able to take materials that were used to serve a Sefer Torah to then use it to serve a, uh, a single safer, a single volume from the Torah. But Amar Rava, further Rava said, Hani zvile duchumshe ukamatre desifre tashvish kedusha nifel. So what are these items? Rashi tells us. Uh, where's the Rashi? These are. How can I find Rashi here? One moment. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, Raji says, Kimin de Luskame, which we learned early, Luskami are like a sack, right? They're like a sack. And Kamatra is an Ergas. Uh, so th- we have sacks and boxes, cases. So if you have uh, sacks and you have cases of Svarim, of Sifri Torah, so they have a status of 
a conscious kedushin in him. They ignore it. They have to be buried. The Gemara has a sheet. Isn't that obvious? If they're used to serve the Sifrei Torah, to store Sifrei Torah, that's like that's like the paradigmatic case of a conscious kedusha. So my the tema, I love the covered of din, the tree of Amah vidi kamash malan. What would have I thought? I would have thought to say that these items serve st- uh, strictly a functional purpose. They don't actually serve. Um, so there's basically two reasons you can make something. You can make something either practically to protect the Torah, or you can make something that doesn't serve a protective purpose, but it's something that uh, enhances something that, um, what's the right word for it? Uh, not embellish. Something that, something, something oh, yeah. that, what was that? Enhance is a good word. Enhance the Torah, something, something that beautifies the Torah. So, halacha lemaisa, uh, let me get you halacha lemaisa over here. What do we actually say? So, we actually say is one of two things. If something t- literally touches the Torah, it's something that actually is holding the Torah, that goes around the Torah, even if it just serves a strictly protective purpose, it's Tashmish de Kedusha. Whereas something which is kolsha asoy likavod, and that's meant to enhance the Sefer Torah, to honor it, even if it's not actually touching the Torah, it would still have a status of tashmishe kedusha. So practically, what does this mean? What about like a parochas? What about a curtain for the Ark of the Torah? So, um, However, when it comes to the parochas, even though it's meant to honor the Torah, um, the per- right, the, the parochas doesn't actually help protect the Torah anymore. It's clearly there to honor the Torah. Uh, still, it's still just considered like it's still it's since it's, it's two steps removed as a status of a tashmish to tashmish, and so the parochas, the curtain on the ark, um, doesn't have any practical kedusha. Got a question. Yes. Um, having been the chairman of the welfare committee in the Young Israel of Wage Grass Bayswater, uh, I had custody over a couple of portable arms that we would bring to a base of all uh, to uh, keep the safer Torah while the person is sitting shiva. So it's there about a week, maybe eight days before we took it back to the shul. What's the status? Of- yes, I mean, well, in terms of the Kedusha, I mean, it's a bona fide safer Torah. So no, I'm, talking, I'm, I'm talking about the portable. The little art, the Aron. Yeah, yeah, the Ark is a Tashish to Kedusha. Yeah, the, the Ark has, uh, is a, has a status of a Tashish to Kedusha, the same way the uh, more established Ark in the Shul also is Tashish to Kedusha. There's a separate question about the propriety of taking a Saber Torah to a Shiva house. I see, Henry, you're nodding your head. You know what I'm talking about. Um, people think it's an Ashkenazic versus Spartic thing. If you look at the Ark HaShulchan, the Ark HaShulchan has a scathing uh, uh, passage against taking a Sefer Torah to a Shiva home. There's halachos about how to transfer a Torah. Now, one of the arguments, the hakel, to transfer a Torah to a Shiva home is that you're not really taking it out of its environment, putting a new one, because it's remaining in the same Ark. It's in the same Aron. So if you were to take the Torah out of the Aron uh, and then bring it to the Shiva home, that would be more problematic. But in, at our shul, actually, we have a separate Ark, like you pointed out, for the Shiva Torah, so in some way, we can kind of view it as it's staying within its established Aron. Okay. Um, and interestingly, when we had the Dayan Shiva home, um, they initially said, we're not going to do Kriya Satora here because we're not going to transfer a Torah. But then we did wind up transferring a Sefer Torah. But then also we did Svartic, Svartic uh, Nusachari. So it was a whole bunch of jumping. It was a lot of fun. Is there also a minhag that you have to have three... You have to lane three times before you can. I've heard that. I don't know if that's yeah, well yeah. Or not. yeah, that's the uh, right because then it's not temporary. You're like, you know, you're actually, you're not just dragging the Torah from place to place, you're actually establishing it in its place. It's more respectable for the Torah. You know, why, why are you, why are you causing such a tircha, trouble for the Torah just for one lane? You're going to drag it back and forth. Um, Rabbi, yeah, I have a question. 
But, yeah. So what's actually wrong with bringing a Sefer Torah to a house of Shiva, even if it's not in the Aron? Um, so the I'm not going to say wrong because, again, you know, Yesha Malismo. But mm -hmm. the reservation to do something like that is because the Sefer Torah, I mean, the... <laughs> This is kind of like this, this, this is kind of like you know against our paradigm, but you know what we do in shul is we take the sefer Torah out of the ark and then we bring it down all the rows and then we bring it over to this person to that person. In truth, really, it should be less the sefer Torah being brought to the people. The people should be coming to the sefer Torah. In fact, there's actually how lucky is that if the Torah passes by you, you should es walk with it and escort it to its yes. until it's resting in its place. Um, yes. So. We're accustomed yes. to the idea that the Torah is brought to us. We're really supposed to inconvenience ourselves and bring ourselves to the Torah. Uh, yeah, but in a shiva home, can't do, they can. can't do that. Yeah. Okay. They, so. But so what's so what's the so what's the reason? What's well, the problem with bringing it to a shiva home? Well, the question is, what's necessity? I mean, you know, especially if kriya said Torah, if Torah reading is a chovas at seaboard, it is a communal obligation. Arguably, you could say that the folks leaning in shul are satisfying that for the community. Um, anyway, very good. This, this is a very worthwhile discussion, worthy of its own cheer. I notice it's 7:52, and we should not exceed an hour. So, if you can do me a favor, guys, uh, I love that we're that there's a lot of relevant questions that come up. Let's finish up the part for tonight, and if we have any remaining time, I'm happy to address any uh, loose ends. Okay, here we go. Uh, oh, wow, we have. Okay, all right, here we go. Ahu um, Kanishka. So happened was there was a shul in Rome that the shul, kind of like how uh, at our shul, we dominate at it, but also we have funerals when necessary. So kind of like the morgue and the shul were together mm -hmm. and they would place the, uh, the deceased in a room that is connected to where the sanctuary was. So, uh, so the issue was that the Kohanim wanted to come into David. Ah, but there's an issue. There's a Tumas Ohel, since they're all under one roof. The Tuma of that niece is going to prohibit the Kohen from even entering the building. So, they went to Rava to seek guidance. What could they do to enable Kohanim to come to the building? and Osuba. So, you should take the Ark and basically put it where that hallway is so that it blocks off that area where the mace is, and it interposes and stops the tuma in its tracks. How does the Aron stop the tuma in its tracks? Well, the Aron is made of wood. And the Havle creates a usli lenakas. Creates a usli lenakas in a kabo tuma, but chutz nea tuma. Basically, you call your Rashi, you'll cite the Drusha. Uh, the Drusha basically says in the Pasuk when it's talking about tuma, the chol creates o beged o or o sap. So there's a heckish masak of a telltale. When it's talking about things that are susceptible to tumma, it talks about sock, which is portable, which is movable. Uh, creates a metaltail, so too the creates the wooden receptacle that's mentioned in the Pasuk, also is talking about a movable receptacle. However, if you have a wooden object which is meant to stay in its place and is not meant to be portable, it is not susceptible to becoming tummy. So the idea is to take this big arc and place it there, interposing between where the base is and where the base like is, and that way it will neutralize the tumma in its tracks. Um, However, the Rabbana responded to Rabbana, they said, uh, It doesn't help, even when there's a Torah in there, they'll sometimes move it around, sometimes they won't. Um, so it's not um, conceptually it makes sense, but practically this Torah is actually a little bit more portable than you thought. So Yehachi, well, I'm sure in that case, it just won't work. But in, in theory, if you had an Torah that was going to stay right over there, and then it's not going to move from that place, it would be able to interpose and block the Tuma from entering into the Beis HaKnesses, which would enable Kohanu to David. Okay, uh, moving forward. Okay. Um, so when you take the uh, the mantle, the coverings of the Torah, and uh, 
they, they're worn out and now you need to discard them, what do you do with them? You use them to make burial shrouds. And these burial shrouds are used, um, okay, so the question is why do we turn into burial shrouds? So there's two conceptions of it. One conception is, well, rather than bury it and have it lose its kadusha altogether, may as well use it for burial shrouds, which retains perhaps a lower level, but some degree of a functional, sanct for a sanctified functional purpose. That's one conception. Uh, the, and Marome Southern at Siv says that actually this, it's not about going from a lower, to a lower level and salvaging some kadusha. This is just, this is the appropriate way to do kinesa. Rather than throw it in the ground, this is the appropriate way um, to use it. And I'm sure there's something poetic about using the same material that covered the Torah to cover the mesa as he leaves this world. But, but they're, they're not big enough to use as a burial shroud. Um, well, you could weave them all together if you have enough that are woven. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we'll, we'll, I guess we'll leave it to the professionals to figure out how they're going to purpose it. Or you could combine it with other things, I'm sure. Uh, but yeah, practically that has to be figured out. Um, so if there's a Sefer Torah that is uh, worn out and no longer usable, you bury it with a Talmud Chacham. And by the way, it doesn't have to be the biggest scholar of the generation, right? It doesn't need to be you know, with Rav Eliashev. It doesn't have to go with one of the Gedol with the Chazanish. Uh, you can go with someone who's Shon HaLachos. If somebody taught, taught like the Mishnayos Kabur at the shul and, you know, that was their thing. Um, they didn't. They didn't get smicha. They didn't do anything uh, particularly scholarly. But you know, they they taught Torah. That's already a chutz for the Torah to be buried with them uh, for someone who was dedicated to the study and teaching of Torah. So Rav Acha Bar Yaakov Uklif Cheres and has to be put into an earthenware vessel. Why? So because that's what the pasuk tells us to do. Finally, getting to our final question, we'll just go briefly onto the next page. Uh, and then we'll wrap up this piece, God willing, next week. One is allowed to turn a base haknesis into a base medrash, but not vice versa. You can't turn a base medrash into a base haknesis. And Rapapa thought the opposite. He thought that a base haknesis has a higher level of kedusha than a base medrash. And it seems the way we paskin is that a base medrash has a higher level of kedusha than a base haknesses. So a base haknesses can be turned to a base medrash, but not vice versa. A base medrash cannot be turned into a base haknesses. Where do we see this in the psukim? Where you know where do we even like get an idea of one way or the other? God willing, next week we will address that point in the following passage of the Gemara. Okay. Oh. Oh, come, 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 come. You want to say bye-bye to everyone? Say bye-bye. Hey. Bye. <laughs> say bye-bye. <laughs> Baby, say bye-bye. Time for cool. bed. <laughs> all right, so, all right, take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you. <laughs> oh, she locked her hands, so that's, that's good. Okay. All right, take care, everyone.